the mouth of the Duwamish River in Seattle. It's a very urban site, so you may hear some sounds in the background of trucks and trains and planes. Our next uh, interview will be with Dennis Clark, which we're going to get even a, a, a further historical perspective. Dennis, what's this? Uh, can I help you with this here? Yeah, let's just set this down here, Alex. Okay. What have you got? Well, what I have here is a model of the watershed that the Duwamish Estuary is part of. And if you look at this model, you'll see that it covers a big area. We are located right about here, right here on Elliott Bay. And a big land area, about 1,500 square miles, used to drain into the Duwamish Estuary. That's what it looked like 150 years ago. But when people started coming here to settle and moving in and taking some of the land that James's people used to enjoy, they started to change the estuary and they started to change the watershed because it didn't work the way they wanted it to. What kind of changes did they make, Dennis? Well, let's talk about some of those changes. The changes started by diverting rivers. The first big change occurred about a century ago, and what happened is this. The lands draining Mount Rainier here, which is the mountain that people will see on the Washington State license plate, was all diverted down south to the Puyallup River in Tacoma. The black area shows land which no longer drains to the Duwamish. This change was uh, added to in 1916 when the Lake Washington Ship Canal was constructed. And what happened then was that all of this area in the northern part of the watershed was also diverted out of the Duwamish drainage. The bottom line is that today the Duwamish drains an area about one-third of the size that it used to drain. And those changes didn't stop just with the land draining into the Duwamish. If we can cut away to a view of what the Duwamish estuary looks like today, we can see some additional dramatic changes right here. Uh, Dennis, what's the blue part of the map we're looking at? The blue part of the map is Puget Sound, and then there are also some blue areas over here on the right side which represent freshwater lakes. And uh, the large um, sort of beige color area around the, the bay and around the mouth of the river, what's that? This is the land area which it makes up modern-day Seattle. What did it used to look like before there was a city here? It used to be covered with forests full of cedar and other evergreen trees as well as deciduous trees. And it was full of game and bird and wildlife. Okay, and then running down through the middle of what is today Seattle, what are these lines that we see on the map? Well, we see one very squiggly line here that twists and turns all the way up here. This is the old channel of the Duwamish, what it looked like 150 years ago. As you can see, it took a long time to get from the bottom of the map up to the bottom of Elia Bay. Okay, and what is uh, projected behind that? Behind that, you'll see a straight blue line moving up. It looks just like a road, and that's what the modern-day channel of the Duwamish looks like. We've completely altered the previous channel of the Duwamish to make it work for us. And uh, estuaries like this, so what's the role of salmon in a place like this? Uh, Den uh, Dennis is going to grab another uh, graphic here for us to look at about the life cycle of the salmon. So Salmon perform two key transitions here in the Duwamish estuary. And one is actually evident behind us because you'll see some nets in the river right now. And that's because the adult salmon are returning to spawn higher up in the watershed. And there are enough salmon that tribal fishermen can actually catch the fish. Dennis, it looks like those fishermen are taking off right now. They just uh, picked some salmon out of that net, it looks like. Yes, they did. And that's a result of a life history that started here several years ago. Much higher up in the watershed, salmon started as eggs. And they spent the first several months of their lives in the freshwater parts of the watershed. When you say the freshwater parts are higher up in the watershed, what are you talking about, Dennis? I'm talking about the rivers and streams that together combined to create the Duwamish River. It's an area which, as I said, is much smaller than it used to be, but it's still about 500 square miles. And that freshwater environment meets and mixes with the saltwater environment right here in the Duwamish estuary. Where's the estuary in this graphic, Dennis? In this graphic, it's shown right here in the center of these two overlapping circles of freshwater and saltwater. And for young salmon coming down here, they're finding the estuary a great place to feed and to grow and to hide from predators and to learn to live in salt water. Now, in a healthy estuary, there would be many more salmon than we find here today. 
So uh, the estuary is maybe a link in the chain of their entire life. Exactly. Can you quickly run through the rest of their life back to the egg stage? Absolutely. The fish, the adult fish going up to uh, the freshwater portions of the watershed today are going up to spawn, which is the word we use to, to um, designate where they lay their eggs in the gravel. The adult fish will then die. The eggs will incubate in the gravel for several months. And then in the spring, the little eggs will hatch. The small fish will grow for several months in the freshwater part of the watershed. As I mentioned, in the spring, they come down to the Duwamish where they'll spend anywhere from several days to several months in the estuary growing, adapting to saltwater. Then they'll start their epic life journey out into Puget Sound and then out into the open ocean. They may swim as far away as Alaska before a little trigger goes off in their brain and it tells them it's time to go home. And the very fish that hatched here several years ago will return to the Duwamish estuary and the cycle will continue again. And maybe they'll get caught in that fishing net out there Some on the they way. Will. Others will pass by to return higher up to the watershed where they'll spawn. How does this development that you outlined in the watershed affect the salmon, Dennis? It affects it in very serious ways because the estuary is a place where they feed. So they need habitats that provide food. They need vegetation overhanging the channel insects falling off the vegetation that provide food for them and they also need um, a rich uh, life under the water that provides them food as well. They need places to hide. They need places to where their bodies can physically adapt to that change to salt water. And the fact that all of these changes we talked about earlier have pretty much covered 97 percent of the habitat here in the estuary means that only three percent is left for the salmon today and that's one of the reasons why across the Pacific Northwest and in the Duwamish we've seen a dramatic decline in the size of fish populations. The size of fish populations you mean the number of salmon coming exactly. through here? Are not as exactly many. we're seeing just a handful compared to what James's people would have seen 150 years ago. Are these kinds of stories common in urban estuaries and urban watersheds? They are across Puget Sound and indeed across the developed world. People are drawn to estuaries for many of the same reasons that James talked about earlier. Their supply of food but and, uh, and a great place to live. They also supply abundant fresh water, access to the interior, and they provide access to the world through the oceans that they're usually connected to. And so most of these areas have been extensively developed, first for agriculture and later for trade and industry. And so great cities of the world like Shanghai and New New York and New Orleans are all located on estuaries with significant impacts for the aquatic resources found there. Okay, what can uh, people do, not only in the Duwamish watershed, but in other parts of the country? Some of our other listeners from might be on the Atlantic coast or in the Gulf Coast. We always say everyone lives downstream, and so everything that everyone does can affect the health of the watershed they're in and the estuary it drains to. Here are three simple things that you can do. One is you can conserve water. Because the less water we take out of groundwater and out of our surface water, the more water will reach the estuary, and fresh, clean water is the lifeblood for estuaries. There are lots of ways that families can find to conserve water. I urge you to talk with your family to figure out what will work best for you. A second thing people can do is be more careful about their use of chemicals around the house, whether that's common household cleaning materials or um, yard and garden chemicals. We can usually reduce the amount of chemicals we use, and that has a benefit in terms of water quality, and it has a benefit in terms of our own personal health. And the third thing people can do is they can get out and volunteer. We're gonna hear more about restoration and volunteer opportunities right here, but wherever you live, there's probably an opportunity to get out and pick up a shovel and to do some good work planting or controlling weeds or cleaning up the estuary or watershed that you live in. So you're saying use less water, don't put poisons in the water or down the drain and help out with restoration projects. I think if everyone makes a little bit of effort, our watersheds in the decades to come will be a lot healthier. Thanks a lot for your time, Dennis. I appreciate it.